Hi, my name is Paul Stanford. I am a political activist from Portland, Oregon, U USA, Estados Unidos. And I have been working to legalize marijuana since I turned 18 back in 1978. I'm 62 now, and I've had some success in terms of being the spokesperson for our campaign to legalize marijuana in Oregon in 2012. And perhaps most significantly, I opened clinics to help medical marijuana patients across the United States, working with 45 doctors in 60 cities across 10 different states. We've helped over 270,000 patients get their medical marijuana permit. But my thesis here today is that we have co-evolved with cannabis for 25,000 years. And uh, cannabis has changed us and we have changed cannabis. And that we all know that cannabis is medicine for cancer, for pain, for gastrointestinal ailments, for spastic disorders, for neurological conditions. We've co-evolved with cannabis to make cannabis work in many, many different ways. Cannabis will help us. And uh, not only is it physical medicine for our bodies, it's also earth medicine for our whole planet. And we need this vital co-evolution, the symbiotic relationship we have with cannabis to continue to help heal what's left of our planet so that uh, we can pass on our most valuable inheritance, uh, life on this planet, and culture of our ancestors to our descendants. So I started the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp back in 1990. And uh, we worked to educate people with a weekly TV show that started in 1996. We still do that today. And we put marijuana legalization on the ballot to legalize marijuana in the United States. I first went to school in China back in 1998. And uh, I learned that China had the world's largest hemp crop. They grew more hemp than any other country. In fact, China used to be called, the, they called themselves the country of hemp and mulberry. Mulberry is what the silkworms ate and to make silk. And only the wealthy could afford to wear silk, but everyone wore hemp until recently. And so uh, I went to China and started to import hemp paper and fabric. And I did that as a business from 1988 to 1997. Since we've legalized marijuana in Oregon in 2019, I've been able to cultivate and give away free cannabis. So this is our garden. These plants are directly in the ground and they're just as wide as they are tall. And so uh, I've grown and given away since 1999, over three metric tons or over 7,000 pounds of high quality cannabis flowers to sick and dying patients. Here's another example of some flowers the night before, or week before harvest. This is my political, I mean, my nonprofit organization. The Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp is a political committee, and the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation is an Oregon nonprofit corporation. And we morphed into the Hemp and Cannabis Foundation Medical Clinics, and that is the business that's helped. 270,000 Americans become legal medical marijuana users could possess and grow cannabis. Cannabis actually originated in Central Asia, north of the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, archaeologists have discovered cannabis pollen in an area going back 25 million years and about 25 to 30,000 years ago, the cultivation of cannabis spread outside of its indigenous area. And by 25,000 years ago, it had spread to the Huanghe, or Yellow River Valley in uh, China, and into the Tigris-Euphrates River Valley in present-day Iraq. 
by 13,000 years ago, its cultivation had spread to uh, the Mediterranean basin. And archaeologists have discovered hemp pollen indicating farming in present day Italy, northern Italy, at the northern tip of the Adriatic Sea. And so uh, that is today it's Italy, long before it was Rome, long before the Etruscans that preceded Rome, cannabis was being cultivated throughout Europe. And so uh, we don't know what those cultures were. It's definitely prehistoric times, but uh, the oldest Western uh, historian is the Greek Herodotus, who wrote his histories about 5,000 years ago. And Herodotus wrote about the Babylonians. This is actually a etching in stone from Babylon. And it's an image of King Harambai. Harambai is known throughout Western civilization as the oldest and the first lawgiver, the first written codified system of legal rules, laws that we know of today were written by Harambai in Babylon. And in fact, that image above this etching of a cannabis plant and Harambai is still used as a national symbol for Iraq. Herodotus, though, the Greek historian, wrote about the Scythians of, uh, in present day uh, Ukraine. And the Scythians, according to Herodotus, domesticated the horse using hemp stalks and hemp stems, and they had a practice, we might call it hot boxing. They would create a tent, put a, a metal basket in the middle of the tent, and hang it on a tripod with hot rocks. And then they would put cannabis flowers on the hot rocks and sit in the tent and commune in their spiritual meetings. So this is some archaeological uh, evidence of the tripods and the altars that they put their hot rocks and the cannabis flowers in. And again, this is from the ancient Greek historian Herodotus, who wrote about that. Now, while cannabis has been cultivated, according to archaeologists, for over 25,000 years, it's been somewhere between uh, 12 and uh, 8,000 years ago, we began to domesticate dogs. And all dogs came from wolves. The scientific name for the wolf is Canis lupus, where all dogs are known as Canis lupus familiaris. Now, the, Latin, the Canis lupus phrase comes from the Roman language, Latin. And in fact, the, the Romans realized that cannabis was highly uh, effective on dogs. And so that's why the root in Latin of cannabis is the same as the root for canine or canis lupus, or as we know, dog, can, domesticated dogs, canis lupus familiaris. But all dogs came from, according to genetic science, just four or five wolves about 10,000 years ago. And we have changed dogs, obviously. And today we have a wide variety of dogs. We have little cute dogs. We have big dogs. We have little dogs. There are even variations in the Chihuahua. So this is just in a period of under 10,000 years, we've made these genetic changes. In fact, all of these farm animals that we know currently were domesticated by civilizations that cultivated hemp. So my belief is that the farm animals obviously were domesticated because we could provide food. And obviously hemp was one of the foods we provided them that they really wanted. Now I'm going to talk about Chinese civilization. I went to school in China for a couple of years and imported hemp paper and hemp fabric from China. This is the oldest, the first Chinese emperor, Sheng Neng, and he is known to have written a pharmacology, a medical book about various plants. He was always wore plants in his garments in, that are depicted. 
And so Sheng Nung wrote about cannabis as the most useful plant. And as I said, the Chinese actually called their country the land of hemp and mulberry. About 500 years ago, the Manchurians conquered China and they changed the name when they took over the, the throne of China to the, the middle country, Zhongguo. Zhongguo means the middle country. But before that, it was the land of hemp and mulberry for 5,000 years. And Sheng Nang started the Chinese civilization that we know of today about 5,500 years ago. This is a ancient piece of pottery that is over 5,000 years old in a Chinese uh, museum. And in those markings across the, 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 that was embedded with hemp fiber. So they can find hemp fibers in those. Apparently this had a hemp uh, protected and that uh, rotted away over time, but there's still hemp fibers in this 5,000 year old piece of pottery. This is the Chinese symbol for hemp are cannabis, and it is ma. And so in the Chinese language, there are four tones, and those four tones change the meaning of the word. In our cultures, in most other cultures, the tone has an emotional context, but in Chinese, it actually changes the meaning of the word. So while this is ma for the fourth tone, the first tone that uses the, the very basic sound, ma, is the first tone. And so it's ma, ma, it's all a high, steady tone. Ma, ma, and of course that means mother, as it does in every human language. So obviously ma is one of the most important verbalizations that we have out there. When we talk about the second tone, the second tone starts high and then goes low. Ma. And ma means horse. And this is the symbol for horse or ma. And then this next one, this is actually you good. It says ni hao. And that you good. And that's how people in China say hello. You good. And so if you add the third tone to it of ma, it's ni hao ma. And this one goes up and down. Ma. And so that is a verbal question mark. Again, a very important concept. So we see the other tones of ma are mother, horse, and a verbal uh, question mark. When you say ni hao ma, that means how are you, or homo estas. But uh, when we go to the fourth tone, it starts low and goes high. Ma, and that means him. This is the current written form of hemp today in China. It's da ma, that's big hemp, da ma. And so uh, the character hemp, that is used in several other words. So you can find this hemp character, ma, in the word for numb, in the word for like you can't feel anything, the word for clever, like you're very smart, the word for indifferent, like I don't care. It's in the word for troublesome. It's in the word for the sparrow, the bird, the sparrow, which loves hemp seeds. And then perhaps something that we all know is the Chinese board game Mahjong. Mahjong also uses the character from hemp. But Ma, or hemp in China, has been used in funeral rites since prehistoric times, before the Chinese. They've used Hemp, and this is a 8,000 year old tomb found in present day China where cannabis plants are placed over the bodies before they are entombed or buried. And so this is one of those examples, but they have found thousands of examples of people buried with hemp plants on top of them. And in fact, hemp and cannabis are integral to China's most important spiritual practice, which is ancestor worship. The Chinese say that a eunuch in the imperial court invented paper from hemp and that the people would not, uh, the emperor would not see the importance of this new uh, 
invention, paper. And so the Chinese uh, eunuch in the imperial court pretended to die, and his friends buried him with a hemp tube up so he could breathe. Then they burned hemp paper over his grave. They dug him up, and he was alive. And so that is the Chinese myth about the discovery of paper, even though we find archaeological evidence that paper preceded was being used before this myth. Anyway, hemp is still very important in funeral practices throughout China. You know, China changed a lot with the communist revolution, but Chinese culture exists out of modern day China. So a lot of the ancient practices of funeral rites uh, are now only observed in Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, Indonesia. Chinese communities still observe what's called the wufu, or the five levels of mourning. If someone in your family, your patriarch, your father, your grandfather passed away, then you have to observe the highest level of mourning. You have to wear this hat made out of hemp. You have to wear hemp clothing, wear hemp sandals, and carry a hemp stalk, a hemp cane for uh, 18 months. And if it was your uncle, it would be six months, another one of the five levels of mourning. And these five levels were enforced by law. If you did not follow the wufu, you would be punished by your community. So this is an example of uh, the wufu uh, garments. This is in present day Malaysia, where they still observe the wufu. You can see that these people are wearing entirely hip clothing and carrying hip stocks. This is from Indonesia, a uh, uh, community observing the wufu and mourning their ancestors with hemp clothing. And this is in present day Taiwan, where again, hemp is integral to uh, honoring your ancestors and mourning them. In present day China, in communist China, they still burn hemp paper money to support their ancestors in their ancestor worship practices. And when a, a relative or a friend has died, they wear a white hemp collar and hemp clothing uh, when they are going to a funeral or observing their mourning process. I'm going to look now at Japan. This is the oldest cave painting in Japan. It's about 12,000 years old. And you can see that the hemp leaf is included here and uh, being brought across the water. And this is the oldest cave painting in all of Japan that they've discovered. Today in present day Japan, while cannabis was made illegal by the Americans, when the Americans conquered Japan at the end of World War II, Douglas MacArthur, is one of his first uh, rules was they had to ban cannabis and they called it marijuana. Or, but one company is a, has about 150 different farms where they cultivate hemp for spiritual practices. In Japan, the primary spiritual practice is called Shinto. And so all Shinto temples are decorated with hemp. And they have to use hemp in the imperial court, in the emperor's court as well. But one company collects the hemp from these 150 farms and they process it for the Shinto temples. And so this is uh, that some pictures from that company. And this is a Shinto temple in Japan. You can see there's a big bundle of hemp fiber. And those are also around the altars. And that white lightning bolt sort of cloth there is also cannabis hemp. So hemp is integral to Japanese spiritual practices. This is another Shinto temple. Again, you see the big hemp bundle with the hemp lightning bolts coming down. But back in 2016, I was honored to go to the first environmental hemp forum in Kyoto, Japan. And I met several people who process hemp fiber into the ornaments 
that are needed by all Shinto temples. In fact, this is an exhibit inside a Shinto temple in Kyoto. And this gentleman makes him the uh, Shinto ornaments and goes and teaches other people how to make them as well. This is in a Kyoto uh, hip, uh, temple, a Shinto temple on top of a mountain in Kyoto. And the fellow here who's pointing at this rainbow hemp rope is actually Mr. Ben Dronkers, the founder of Cincy Seeds and Hemp Flax. The his Cincy Seeds is the largest hemp seed company in the world. And Hemp Flax is also the largest hemp provider of uh, hemp fiber materials. They even produce hemp fiber for the euro note or the money. We'll get back to more of that later. At the 2016 Environmental Hemp Forum, I met Nabuku Niki. And Nabuku Niki is the founder of uh, a family on the northern island of Hokkaido that has been cultivating hemp for the emperor's family for more than 1,300 years. In fact, Nabuku Niki is also the 183rd head of the Niki clan that has been growing hemp for the emperor's ceremonies since uh, I think it's about 700 AD. And uh, uh, he gave a presentation about his family and their sacred rituals in cultivating hemp for the emperor. Back in 2019, uh, well, this is actually Akie Abe. She is the former first lady of Japan, the wife of Shinzo Abe, who was brutally murdered earlier this year. My wife and I had the honor of sharing the stage at the Environmental Hemp Forum in Kyoto with Akie Abe, the uh, prime minister's wife at the time. In 2019, uh, the current the emperor decided to retire, which was unusual. Usually they retire by dying. But he decided to retire and turn the throne of Japan over to his son. And so that started this sacred process. And this is part of the sacred harvesting of hemp fibers for the emperor's coronation, for the new emperor to take the throne. And so this is a hemp harvest in June of 2019. This is from July of 2019. They're, they have processed the hemp fiber into thread and they are taking the sacred hemp fiber to a loom to start making it into cloth where it's made into clothes. And then this is the emperor and his father, the former emperor, at the coronation performing the what they call the sacred rice ceremony. So they have to use hemp in co conjunction with rice in the coronation or the enthroning of the new emperor back in 2019. So who, hemp is still integral to Chinese spiritual practices. It's considered hemp and rice are considered the sacred plants of Shinto. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Egypt. In Egypt, they had many different goddesses and goddesses. And one of them that we're going to talk about is known as Shashat. Shashat was considered the goddess of education, writing, and learning. And Shashat was always depicted with a little bubble, like a cartoon speech bubble, above her head and a cannabis plant. So in Egyptian culture, Shashat was the goddess of learning and writing, and she's always depicted with cannabis. And here is another more modern representation of Shashat. They had hemp flowers in Egypt, and this was uh, an urn that's about 4,000 years old that collected hemp flowers. And so there were hemp flower residues in this. Again, this is from Egypt, about 4,000 years old and it was a pot of hemp flowers. In fact, when they found the, the, the tomb of what we call King Tut or Tutankhamun in 1922, it was discovered, they found that the vault to the tomb was tied with a hemp rope, and that this hemp rope had been put there to 
uh, secure the tomb in 1324 BC. So that hemp rope is more than 3,300 years old, seems to still be doing the job. Now we're going to talk about South Asia and Hindu culture. Cannabis has always been sacred in Hindu culture. It's mentioned in the Vedas, the oldest written texts uh, in in the world. The, the Rig Veda is the, the first Veda. In the third Veda, they talked about a pharmacopoeia of medicines and hemp was considered the, the most important medicine and a very sacred medicine in the Vedas going back over 5,000 years. And so this is the, the god Shiva. Shiva was uh, the savior of mankind, according to their belief. The world had been poisoned. All the water in the world, according to Hindu belief, had been poisoned. And Shiva drank all of that poison into his body. And that's why he turned blue. And then he smoked cannabis in a chillum and he drank bong, which is a cannabis infused milk. And that is a part of the sacred rituals involving Shiva and the way Shiva deep uh, made the world safe for us, according to Hindu religion. But several other gods and goddesses are also uh, associated with him. This is also a representation of Shiva. This is Ganesh. Ganesh uh, was always represented with, with cannabis and mushrooms and was a, uh, a god of the most religious Hindu gurus. They would use cannabis to commune with uh, their spiritual practices. And this is Kali. Kali is a theoretically came from Shiva and Kali also was a uh, uh, proponent of hemp as medicine and hemp as a spiritual practice. So now I'm going to talk just briefly about Buddhism. Buddha was a prince in India and he left his family to become a peasant and to help lead us to enlightenment. And so the Buddha is said to have sat under a Bodhi tree, uh, and he sat there for three years in present-day Nepal, and he only ate one hemp seed a day for three years before he was enlightened. And he decided instead of ascending to Nirvana under, you know, uh, Buddhist practices, that he would stay on Earth and lead all humanity to enlightenment. But he is said to have reached this enlightenment by eating just one hemp seed a day for three years. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about Judeo-Christianity. Many of us know that Moses went on top of Mount Eret to meet with God in a burning bush and receive the Ten Commandments. This is a representation of Moses talking to the burning bush. And while there's no real direct evidence what kind of bush that was. Uh, the artist who created this obviously had an idea. This is a Jewish temple in present day Israel. It was discovered or made public in uh, 2020. And it's a very small uh, rock room that was found inside this temple. And again, it was like that hot box uh, method of ingestion, they would take hashish, cannabis resin, and put it on top of this heated rock. They would heat that rock up, and uh, then the hashish fumes would fill the air, and they, the Jewish people would commune with uh, Jehovah, or God. This is a depiction of King David being anointed with oil. That oil is hemp seed oil, and so hemp seed oil infused with a large amount of cannabis. You would, they would take about 10 liters or a gallon, two and a half gallons of oil and put three kilos or over seven pounds of hemp flowers into that 10 liters and infuse the oil and then use this highly psychoactive oil to anoint people into the Jewish religion. And so, again, this is a depiction of the anointment of 
King David. This is a depiction of anointing Jesus Christ. And Jesus is his name, but Christ is actually a term that means anointed. So this Jesus, when we say Jesus Christ, we're saying that Jesus was anointed to be a king and that his uh, he was anointed with this highly potent cannabis, cannabis flower oil. Now, this is a church in present day Sicily. It's called Montreal it's near Palermo on the island of Sicily in Italy. And this church is from 1100 A.D. Or about 900 years ago. And inside, there are more than 1,200 uh, paintings on the walls in gold leaf. And out of these 1,200 images that are painted on the walls, more than 100 of them have depictions of cannabis. And these paintings were covered over in glass back in 1150 AD. So over 870 years ago, all of these paintings were covered in glass. And back then, uh, people did not read and write. People in general, when they came to church, they were either learned from the spoken word or they looked at pictures. And so this is a picture inside the Montreal Cathedral on the island of Sicily. And it depicts Jesus healing the sick. And you can see there's a cannabis leaf right there in it. This is another depiction. You can see up above the doorways on the, the left side, you see Eve at the apple tree talking to the snake. And the next panel to the right shows Adam coming and Eve giving her an apple off this apple tree while the snake is there. Then the next panel shows God and the apple tree Adam and Eve are covering their, their groin, uh, and there now is this uh, cannabis leaf above them, depict, depicting knowledge of good and evil. So upon e And the snake is slithering away. So again, people did not read and write then, so learning from these pictures was the way they, they would learn that. But you can see cannabis had some, just appeared as soon as they ate the apple. And here's a close-up of that panel. You can see the snake is slithering away. And, and there's the, the cannabis leaf between Adam and Eve. And God is there saying, what have you done? And then God taught them for a while. And they, and they, they say, oh, we're sorry. Uh, uh, but you can see again that the cannabis leaf is there depicting the knowledge of good and evil that were opened when Eve ate that apple. And again, this is another panel from uh, the Montreal Cathedral in Sicily, present day Italy. I'm not going to try to describe what's going on in these other panels, but you can see that cannabis was considered very, very important to early Christianity. In fact, even the stained glass windows in the Montreal Cathedral show cannabis above Jesus and Mary. This is the top of a bridge, a cupola, in uh, Venice, uh, northern Italy. And so it was right, one of the main ports in the world at the time, Venice. And this is right at the ports. And over the top of the bridge, it says, Cannabis Protectio, or Cannabis Protect Me. The sailors going out to sea hoped that the rigging on their ships, which was made of cannabis, and the sails and the oakum in the the between the boards to keep out the water and the use of cannabis itself as a medicine that that would protect them. Therefore, cannabis protectio. Now we're going to look a little bit at South America. This is a church in San Rafael, which is at the in the central valley of Chile, and it is in San Rafael near Los. Uh, Andes and at the uh, base of the tallest mountain in the Western Hemisphere, the Ancagawa. So you can see the Ancagawa on a clear day above this valley. And this church was constructed in 1705 
And if you look right above the door of this church, you can see you had to walk under this depiction of a cannabis leaf to get inside the main cathedral in San Rafael. And in 1535, the Spanish began cultivating him in the Central Valley of Chile. You know, you could see Ancangawa out at sea because it's the tallest mountain in the Western Hemisphere. So it was something they could easily navigate to, and they would get new hemp ropes, new hemp sails, new oakum for between the boards of their ship. It was very, very important to the conquistadors and the Spanish going around the world that they have a good supply of hemp. And they produced it from 1535 until 1972 in the Central Valley of uh, Chile. And so this shows a, a hemp harvest in Europe, and it was very important. Here's a photograph from Hungary. And again, the people came out in their finest clothes to harvest the cannabis fiber, which is very intense work. But uh, we're going to go forward a little bit more in time. Here's a hemp harvest in the 1930s in Kentucky. And you can see the hemp goes as far as the eye can see. They put it up in bales and let it weather. They called that redding, kind of like rotting, but it was called redding. And then what it made it easier to take the long hemp fibers off the stalk of the cannabis plant, leaving the herd behind. Traditionally, that herding was animal bedding. That herd was animal bedding and uh, fuel. They would burn it. But they would save the long outer fast fibers, the bark of the cannabis, to make canvas, rope, lace, linen, paper, and other things. They began to mechanize it. This is a Kentucky hemp harvest in the 1930s, I think it's 1936. And they also had cannabis medicines in our pharmacopoeia until the 1930s. Eli Lilly, Park Davis, even Johnson & Johnson, present day uh, companies that still exist, they all had a variety of cannabis medicine. This is the Johnson & Johnson package. You can see it says salicylic acid and Cannabis Indica. I collect antique cannabis uh, bottles and, and tins. And this is a tin that is about this wide. And you open it up and there's a one meter long patch of cannabis resin mixed with aspirin, little aspirin sprinkles. And it's backed by cloth. And you can put that on your arm if you had pain, if you had skin disease, if you had cuts. It would protect you and, and help take away the pain. But <clears throat> again, that was from John is from Johnson and Johnson. You know, back in 1916, the United States Department of Agriculture produced a bulletin, Bulletin 404. It's called Hemp Herds as a Paper Making Material. Hemp was primarily cultivated for that outer bark fiber that makes canvas, rope, lace, linen, and the finest papers. But the interior herd had been wasted as animal bedding would be burned. Well, this study from the United States Department of Agriculture, Bulletin 404, said that that waste product from producing canvas, rope, lace, and linen from fast fiber, that this herd fiber uh, was would make more than four times more paper than the most productive tree species. Again, this was a byproduct of making hemp bast fiber and hemp seed for food and oil. So this had been a waste product previously, and the Department of Agriculture study written by Lester Dewey said that uh, this waste product could be used to make four, more than four times more paper than trees. This is Henry Ford who began manufacturing automobiles at the turn of the 20th century. And he, in the early 1940s, made a hemp car where the body was made out of a mixture of hemp fibers, flax fibers, hemp seed oil, and flax seed oil. Scientists, even today, have trouble distinguishing between flax uh, fiber and hemp fiber. They're very, very similar. But hemp fiber is much longer. 
Well, this is Henry Ford, and he's swinging a sledgehammer at the body of this experimental car made out of hemp fiber. And the sledgehammer would just bounce off without any uh, scratches. And there are videos out there of this. You can see it in the Australian news production from 1992 called Hemp, the Billion Dollar Crop. But this is Henry Ford. And then this is actually money, obviously, from the United States. This is from 1914, and it has the signature of the uh, Department of Treasury as Andrew Mellon. Andrew Mellon was the Secretary of the Treasury, the money in America from 1914 until 1938 when uh, uh, Franklin Roosevelt got rid of him. But on the back of this $10 bill, we see this depiction of farming and industry. Well, when you look closely at the farming, they are actually collecting bundles of hemp fiber. You see that those fibers are taller than humans and they collect this. Is, so they actually depict on the back of the money, hemp farming back in 1914 on the US $10 reserve note. Now, Andrew Mellon's daughter married Harry Anslinger, and Harry Anslinger became the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in 1932, and he is the person, more than any other, that's responsible for marijuana prohibition. Not only did he use lies about cannabis, saying it caused people to kill their family and friends and go crazy, as represented in the movie Reefer Madness, which he directed making in Hollywood. And he directed some other movies like Marijuana Assassin of Youth. And he told Congress that marijuana was a deadly new drug. Well, they used this word marijuana from Mexico's slang uh, as to play on American racism and anti-Hispanic bias. So they said that marijuana was a deadly new drug. And Harry Anslinger was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics from 1933 until uh, President Kennedy fired him in 1961. But in 1960, he got the United Nations to pass the Single Convention Treaty, and that became the basis of international prohibition of cannabis. So he obviously followed his uncle's dictates in making sure hemp was illegal to protect Americans' petrochemical industries because hemp fuel will, and it make three times more fuel than any other farm crop, and it was a direct competition with uh, petroleum products. In fact, Henry Ford was always a proponent of hemp and plant fuels, ethanol, uh, alcohol, uh, where... Uh, obviously, the petroleum companies wanted to sell you their, their product. And, you know, anybody can make hemp fuel, but to make petroleum, you've got to pump it out of the ground and build expensive refineries. So it was capital intensive. So only the very rich could produce petroleum-based fuels. They wanted to get rid of hemp-based fuels that anyone could produce on their farm. You know, Popeye the Sailor Man is said to have eaten spinach to gain his strength. But the, the, the history is that uh, spinach was a slang term for cannabis. This is the cover of one of the first Popeye comic books in 1934. And I don't think he's smoking the spinach. Louis Armstrong was one of the most famous jazz musicians. He was famous around the world. He always used cannabis and advocated for cannabis legalization. He said that from the time they made it illegal, he got an opportunity to meet with many different presidents. He would tell them, make marijuana legal. Of course, they ignored it. This is from the early 1960s. This is a very famous American poet, Allen Ginsberg. He started a group called Lemar. And Lemar, for legalization of marijuana, advocated for the legalization of marijuana. And so this is from a protest for 
that Allen Ginsberg organized in New York City back in the late 50s. But he continued to work with this group, Limar. And Limar, uh, on the West Coast, they started a company called Amorphia that made cannabis growing papers. And so this is an advertisement for Amorphia. And they took the profit from Amorphia selling cannabis rolling papers, and they used that money to put an initiative petition on the ballot in the state of California in 1972. That was the first time that marijuana legalization was voted on in the United States in 1972. And it was Amorphia's profits that uh, uh, helped finance that, to put that on the ballot. And it was voted on in 1972, and it was voted down with just 32% of the vote. That was the first marijuana vote in the United States. And in 1973, Oregon became the first state to decriminalize cannabis, to make it where you wouldn't go to jail, just paid a fine. And so uh, California did that in 1974. By the end of the 70s, uh, 10 states had been decriminalized marijuana. This is a poster from a protest in Washington, D.C., in front of the White House. It's called the White House Smoke-In that takes place on July 4th. It's been going on for over 50 years now. Started in 1972 and uh, became, they started calling it the Smoke-In in 1976. And this is a poster from the 1978 White House Smoke-In. I actually went to this protest just a week after my 18th birthday. And so uh, this was a poster that uh, it was actually covered in the news on television about the smoking, and I decided I want to go. I didn't see this poster beforehand, but uh, this is a poster from that event in 1978. This is a photo from November 1st of 1985, and I am standing there uh, half cut off to the right, and I've got my hand on the petitions. We are inside the Oregon State Capitol, and we are turning in petitions for the second vote in the history of the United States on marijuana legalization. The fellow in the background between the woman and the man in the foreground, you can see his face and his glasses and his beard. That's Jack Herrick, who wrote The Emperor Wears No Clothes, The History of Hemp and Cannabis. He actually came into my house for about three months to put together the very first edition of the emperor wears no clothes. And I did research and found that China had the world's largest hemp crop. And that's when I decided to start studying Chinese. But that's Jack Hare I, some other people, Anthony Taylor, Lindsey Bradshaw, at the office of the Secretary of State turning in petitions to qualify for the second marijuana vote that happened a year later. It's actually still the earliest initiative to qualify in Oregon history. That's another story. But uh, uh, we made a vote in November of 1986, and we lost overwhelmingly. The whole Reagan, President Reagan administration came down on us. The vice president at the time was George H.W. Bush. He later became the president after Reagan, and his son became president later, George W. Bush. But George H.W. Bush toured Oregon for two weeks in January of 1986, organizing against our vote in November of 1986. And in the end, we just got 27% of the vote, less than they got in California a dozen years earlier. But we came together and continued to work on legalization. And I continued to work on putting marijuana legalization on the ballot. This is Jack Herr in front of a store uh, where it's a photo a Polaroid photo of us looking at Polaroid photos. It's Jack Herr, John Sajo, and me there in the, the leather jacket. This is my student ID from 1988, and it uh, uh, is from Zhengzhou University in central China in Henan, the seat of Chinese culture. And I studied Chinese so I could import hemp paper and hip fabric. 
And this is me approximately 1991 in my hemp paper company and some photos that were made. We And I, I sold hemp paper under my company, Tree Free Eco Paper, starting in 1988 until 1997. And I had to... Uh, uh, paper is a capital intensive industry, so I had to give that up. I had three little children at the time, but I had started a cable TV show before I ended this company called Cannabis Common Sense. And I still do that TV show today. And it's on cable channel 11 in Portland, Oregon, and in, on other channels in Oregon and Washington State. And it's also on the internet. And so these are some frames from our TV show, there's our TV studio, and we still are making Cannabis Common Sense. We've done more than 1,140 episodes to date, and we'll make another show almost every Friday night. And so this is in our cable TV studio. If you want to watch it, we have it on Facebook at facebook.com slash restore him. That has a following of over 600,000 likes. And it's also available on YouTube at youtube.com slash Cannabis Common Sense. This is on the set of that show. We have Madeline Martinez and uh, Keith Strop. Keith Strop started the biggest uh, marijuana legalization group in the world, Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Law. So it's good to have Keith Strop on our show. You see, I also had antique medical marijuana containers and other hemp products there on our desk. And I would go through many, many shows and talk about the antique hemp medicines and hemp products. We burned a little hemp flame with hemp fuel, hemp oil, and uh, a hemp uh, a wick and that we burned as the hemp flame of freedom. And we still do that when we're in the studio. Here I am with Jorge Cervantes. Jorge is actually from Oregon, too. I began working with him in 1985. I'm still good friends with him. There are pictures that I from my garden in most of his books, including Marijuana Horticulture and his Cannabis Encyclopedia. I'm actually included in Jorge's Cannabis Encyclopedia. If you look at one, you can see it on page uh, 100. This is my office for uh, THCF Medical Clinic. This is our head office in Portland, Oregon. And uh, we also had offices, as I said earlier, across the country. This is our Seattle office. Uh, this is our Denver, Colorado office. So we started in Oregon in 1998. 1999, actually, and then we opened in Washington in 2001, Hawaii in 2002, Colorado in 2003. Altogether, as I said earlier, we opened in 10 states, saw patients in 60 cities, and have helped over 270,000 Americans get their permits to possess, use, and grow medical marijuana. But uh, I still do this today as well. It's a smaller business. There's another background story I won't go into. Uh, but uh, uh, this is our Denver office. This is the stage of the Seattle Hip Fest. The Seattle Hip Fest is the largest marijuana legalization uh, protest in America. It hasn't happened with the pandemic, but we're trying to get it going back again. But we would have 200 to 250,000 people a year come to the Seattle waterfront to protest marijuana prohibition that's one of the reasons Washington and Colorado were among the first states to legalize marijuana. In 2012, when Washington and Colorado voted on marijuana legalization, we did that in Oregon too. And this is me on the set of a local television uh, station, KATU Channel 2, an ABC affiliate, being interviewed about marijuana legalization. And here is a uh, banner from 2012 shows that uh, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington voted to legalize marijuana then in 2012. Uh, Amendment 64 in Colorado was backed by the Marijuana Policy Project, and they raised over $3.5 million 
from Peter Lewis, the owner of a big insurance company and others for that uh, successful campaign in Colorado where they got 54% of the vote to legalize marijuana in 2012. In Washington with I-502, it had even larger backing from the uh, Drug Policy Alliance and the billionaire financier George Soros that backs the Drug Policy Alliance. And they put over $6 million into legalization in Washington state. I financed through my medical clinics the vote in Oregon on Measure 80. And I put almost all the money I put into it before to qualify for the ballot. Actually, after we qualified for the ballot using about $800,000, we actually only had another $100,000 for the campaign. And uh, we lost in 2012 with uh, a, a vote of 47% in favor and 53% against. So it was the very same year in 2012 that Colorado and Washington became the first states. We almost became the first state, but we became the wave of second states. We went back, gathered enough signatures. This is a billboard on a major highway, Interstate 5 in Oregon, saying prohibition is the problem and hemp is the answer. So uh, that banner was up there for about three years. And in 2014, we voted again for legalization and we won and marijuana became legal in Oregon. There were these contests about cannabis, just as there are cannabis cups today. And I won a number of uh, awards for growing cannabis as a master grower, you know, a friend of Jorge Cervantes and Ed Rosenthal. So these are some of the trophies and ribbons I won at the Oregon Medical Cannabis Awards and the uh, uh, Southern Oregon uh, uh, Cannabis Cup there. I grew for many different patients. Among them is a famous country music singer, Willie Nelson. Willie Nelson is uh, well known in America as a cannabis proponent. In America, he's the most famous cannabis smoker in America. And he's still out there touring at the age of 88. This is his house on the island of Maui in Hawaii. And... Uh, uh, he posed for this picture with me. This is on his bus. I think this is down in Riverside, California. This is a poster, a little, actually a sticker that Greenpeace made using my hemp paper, approximately uh, 1995. You can see there in small print under Take It Back, it says printed on tree-free eco paper with 50% hemp and 50% straw paper. <clears throat> you know, I think hemp seeds are very, very important. We need hemp seed to fill all of our culture's needs and to stop greed. Hemp seed meal is the most nutritious food in terms of protein. It has the perfect balance of amino acids for human health. Though soy produces more protein ounce for ounce, Hemp produces more protein than soy by a factor of five to one. And soy protein is not as digestible as hemp protein. Hemp protein's essential fatty acids, the omega-3, 6, and 9, perfectly match humans' nutritional needs. And the eight amino acids in hemp seed are in the perfect balance for humans' nutritional needs. Again, we've co-evolved with hemp for over 25,000 years. and We've grown it to meet our needs. And so we're in this symbiotic relationship with him where we've changed him and hemp has changed humanity. This is a package of body care products produced by the body shop back in the 1990s. The owner of the body shop, Anita Roderick, made a documentary about my friend Jack Herr called the emperor of hemp. And she used hemp products and pioneered hemp body products around the world. Unfortunately, she passed away from cancer about 10 years ago. Here's another depiction of high THC hemp. You know, we have this irrational fear of THC. We talk about limiting the THC, but while high doses of THC 
can be very psychoactive. They've never killed anyone. And people rebound from that in just a few days. For most people, for 990 people out of 1,000, cannabis is safe and healthy. A few people, like one out of 1,000, uh, have a uh, schizophrenia that is set off by ingesting cannabis. So, but it's a lot safer than alcohol, which about 15 to 20% of the people have major problems with. High THC hemp produces three times more seed per acre than low THC hemp. It also produces about twice as much fiber. So as long as we are only cultivating low THC hemp, hemp with uh, uh, less than 1% THC, we will never see cannabis reach its full potential. We need to stop this irrational fear of THC. High THC produces much more seed oil, much more seed protein, much more fiber. And so, you know, when mammals begin to breastfeed their young, uh, a substance called colstrum starts to flow before lactation, which is producing milk and the nutrition. And this colstrum is mainly endogenous THC. The body produces this endogenous THC. Scientist in Israel named Raphael McCullum named it anandamide back in the 1990s, and he discovered the whole endogenous endocannabinoid system in our body. That's led to enormous breakthroughs in neuroscience. But high THC hemp is much more productive than low THC hemp. And you can see we can get a lot of <clears throat> uh, THC from seed production. But hemp seed oil is a fuel and very, very healthy. And we need to start using hemp seed oil. Uh, if you mix it with 15% ethanol or alcohol, it burns hotter and cleaner. But pure hemp seed oil can be poured into any diesel engine you can turn the key and run your diesel engine on pure hemp seed oil. And we need to get back to that. We need to start making hemp fuel again, which won't add to the, the carbon dioxide on the planet. If we were using hemp oil, we would not see the huge growth in uh, global warming. Hemp can solve many of our problems from feeding the hungry with hemp seed, fueling our energy and our cars with hemp seed oil, clothing our people, uh, and building materials made from hemp fiber, papers, uh, all of that can be made from hemp. And so we have co-evolved with hemp for over 25,000 years, and hemp has changed us, and we have changed hemp. And we need that evolution to continue to try to save what's left of our biosphere and pass that on to our descendants. Again, hemp is earth medicine, and I urge you to restore hemp. And this is our organization, the Campaign for the Restoration and Regulation of Hemp. And if you need to reach me, uh, you can see our TV show at Facebook.com slash restore hemp. And you can reach me, D. Paul Stanford, at Gmail, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. It's all under D. Paul Stanford. So thank you for watching my presentation. I hope I taught you a thing or two. Feel free to reach out to me and ask some questions if you have them. And restore hemp. Good day.